Tom, you were a sales leader before, and Jimenez's goal is to build a product that increased productivity of sales teams. So what kind of problems did you see as a sales leader that led you to start Jiminy? Oh, it's a great question, Artem. Uh, <clears throat> I think for me, um, if you go back, feels a while ago now to like 2015, uh, visibility of performance is really the, the thing that I found most tough. So especially as <clears throat> our sales team got bigger in my previous company, I ran sales teams. I was an SVP of sales. When you had companies in different geos, you were completely reliant on what was in Salesforce. And that was dictated to by what the person decided to maybe put in or not. And literally businesses were running off that, <clears throat> which for me is that it's not true. It's very gray um, and not very black and white. So, yeah, the visibility of performance was a real trigger for me. Like, how can you really understand what's going on? How can you help and support your team get better? And what was that journey? What were the steps where you thought about, OK, these are the types of functionality? I would love to have. And when you decided that it's enough of a critical mass of things you would like to introduce into your own sales team that you said, okay, this is the functionality I will build in my own product. Yeah, I think a lot of the time, good ideas for a lot of founders come from something they've experienced that's a pain, right? And then I, like, oh, you know, this is frustrating. How can I fix this? So if I go back to like 2013 in New York, you know, I'd have uh, the sales team there, right? Yeah, for people old enough will remember, you'd have like WebEx, but you, you wouldn't dial in through WebRTC or like uh, through the browser. You would usually like use an Avaya desk phone or something like that. You'd have Salesforce to be putting data in, but a salesperson would sit there with like a notepad and a pen. Yeah, so all of this was disconnected. Nothing was talking to each other. Everything was manual. And then at the same time, we were big on coaching and training and developing our team. But if we, we all use Macs, and then if you wanted to listen to a recording off the Avaya phone, you had to log into a PC and look for a spreadsheet of like a list of calls. And it was just like to actually, <clears throat> one, put decent data into Salesforce and have a slick process when you're selling over video or voice, you know, all of those things was it hard anyway and then actually to do anything with that data was almost impossible because it wasn't easy enough so all of those things uh came together really and for me everyone calls it remote selling or selling now but it used to be called inside sales right where people were selling over like video and voice and we just believed that that would be the dominant way that everyone would sell it just got definitely accelerated a little bit through covid for sure and Fast forward to today, what are the, now Jiminy is much bigger than it was back then in your imagination and in first versions. So talk about the scope of things that Jiminy is capable of today. Yeah, well, when we started, it, it, the, the vision was like, imagine Spotify for all your customer calls, like in the cloud, that, that, that was the vision. So the very, very first I, alpha, like had recordings, You'd pull in a recording, you'd be able to write a little comment around it, whatever. Uh, and then over time. So I think we realized how valuable it was to like mine the data. So it started with a video conference then it became voice, then it became email. Yeah. So ultimately the most valuable asset that sales teams have and that businesses have is those interactions with customers and being able to derive um, insights from there to one, help the team and help the businesses. Uh, where it becomes super powerful. You can see it on a really kind of like micro level, one-to-one, -one, like I'm looking in the mirror versus more macro, like holistic, like I'm looking at everything. So um, yeah, the, there's lots of different benefits to it, but it's definitely evolved over time. You never start, like I'm sure a lot of your listeners know this, you never start with uh, uh, a big complicated product. You, you build it out over time, you kind of start with an MVP and try and keep it simple and build from there. And in terms of your customer profile, who are your typical customers today and how did they evolve over the years? Yeah, I'm like um, 
again i'm sure people know and if they don't like crossing the chasm you know in terms of like having early adopters and then when it becomes mass market so i think it's just coming out of the early adopters phase like intelligence conversation intelligence from <clears throat> how we how we practically use it today so if you're like a SaaS or a tech company or you're vc backed and you've got quite a modern approach you probably know what conversation intelligence is if you're a different type of organization or b2b you, you probably haven't got it i mean 90 percent of the over 95 percent of the companies that sign up uh, every single week or month have never had this technology before so it's still emerging it's still new the the market is growing all the time so it's still definitely uh a kind of long way to go both in terms of the tech and how people uh think about using it yeah definitely a long way to go and uh you're offering the product to certain segments of the customers so talk about it as it smbs mid-market large corporates yeah sorry so the the it's basically sales teams to start so we kind of have like very much a land and expand model so it starts with the sales team this is 80 20 rule right then it'll go into like bdr sdr at the same time then cs then support so i think nearly like 30 to 40 percent of our customers have the whole what i'd call in a modern business like a growth team anyone customer facing but then we have something really cool called insight seats so the whole business can be on there from ceo to cfo through product to marketing so actually the whole business can benefit from from using the platform at no extra cost uh, which is super helpful because they get they get insights from it as well that way right and that's super helpful for the retention because the more people use the product at the company i assume the more rely reliable uh the more dependent they become on the product and the harder it is for them to like it's it's better for the retention overall let's put it this way yeah i mean do you remember like people go through phases before ai and everything do you remember when big data was a, a thing and everyone was like oh you know that's the that's the kind of trend or the wave and I think it's it's interesting, like we kind of jump onto a new wave before we've cracked a, pre a previous wave completely, if that makes sense. But like even now, like we have a customer API and how customers can just take our data and use it in Power BI or Looker or wh whatever system they, they use is really, really powerful because they want to use it to, you know, aggregate all the data together and then run different reports that are completely custom or relevant to their own business. I see. You see this as a viable way of uh, growing your product, becoming more of a data platform eventually for the whole organization. Uh, well, could, we could go down a whole rabbit hole of consolidation and tech and SaaS tools and things like that. But, you know, of course, I'd be, I think, you know, there's different parts of it, right? So there's like, if you talk about sales tech, which is a space that we're in or customer facing you you've got like the whole data enrichment and buying data then you've got i call what we're in like capture and processing and then you've got like analytics reporting insights so you know over time these things will come together like we've already take uh take it and started to do forecasting and different things like that so these things kind of overlap over time for sure um but yeah i think customers need different systems to do different things to answer the question in different ways so there'll always be a place. I think you make yourself, you know, I understand what your question is as well. Like, oh, you know, if we have an API, are we opening ourselves up to just be exposed? But, you know, the more helpful you are to the business, the more you can offer them, you know, because that that's a, a strategic tactical level that they're using that data. But then if the actual platform is being used operationally by the team, like, you know, 100% adoption using it all the time, it's, a, it's almost like a different use case for the data. Yeah, but still sitting on top of at least uh, the go-to-market data and making it available operationally or analytically to every part of the organizations that need to make decisions mm -hmm. based on that data. Yeah. Makes sense. And in terms of the measuring or defining the success of Gemini implementation today, how do you define it? organizations 
there's lots of different elements to that. So first of all, we have a health score that we look at. So there's certain things in the first 90 days we need customers to do. If they do those things, one, it means it's successful. It's like, um, you know, in terms of actually, like, have we got someone through those first few steps ultimately? But then if they're doing those things, then they're super engaged and it's actually actually working. So that's really feeds into like retention and, and using the platform. The, the impact of using it, um, I think, goes through stages. So you have like operational value, like the team start using it, go, wow, I love it. It saves me time. It automates my workflow. Then as they start to use other parts of the platform, it's like, wow, it's changing our tactics in terms of how we coach week to week. And then when the business starts using the data, it becomes strategic. So it's definitely a journey um, into like how the different parts of the business um, can use it. Um, but yeah, there's stuff that's instant and the stuff that happens over time as we work with customers for longer, longer, basically. Can you talk about a couple of uh, maybe representative case studies of how Chimney has been implemented at your customers? What are your favorite examples? Oh, I've got one that's actually top of mind because it happened the other day. So this company, um, I think it's going to go up on our website soon, but, but basically, uh, I don't know, it's about five, 600 sales reps, but this could apply to a team with 30, 40, exactly the same way, right? Um, so they had different geos, lots of different teams, um, and in their offering, fairly transactional sale, because a lot of time people look at this software and go, ah, well, you know, it's just for bigger teams or, you know, bigger deals or whatever, but uh, maybe two, three, four steps max in their process. So they had six month contracts, 12 month contracts, 18 month contracts, right? And what they could see through the data very, very quickly is that the whole business in every geo wasn't actually even discussing or talking about 12 month contracts. They could see that. So uh, we have something called the Jiminy Academy. It's, it's really good to see this data. We've got to do something about it. So we help them create a coaching strategy and that changes each quarter dependent on what's important to them. So obviously uh, we help them work on, you know, selling 12 month contracts. You fast forward four months, um, that company sold like $1.8 million of like 12 month deals. You know, so the, the value of the, of, uh, you know, our software to, compared to how it impacts revenue and performance, that's just like one use case of one data set of one thing that the company is trying to achieve. So we, we always look at it as like, right, what is the key metric that business is looking to work on or improve this year? How can we like support them in achieving that, you know, and like what, what is the, what's going to be the impact of us being able to help them with that? Could be that the company went through M&A and they've got new products, could be a million different things, but yeah. So uh, they're able to really use that to be able to support their process. And despite you having quite a bit of customers, you managed to mm -hmm. find that thing for each and every one and go through that work with them to identify it and to implement it based on Jiminy? Well, a lot of that is like, a lot of it is self-service, like we don't have to do it, but like, I think if you look at our ratio of accounts to CSM, it's probably under what the average is, as in like in a good way. So um, we give more time. We've also split even as we grow in CS, you've got technical onboarding, you've got customer enablement, which is just training. Um, we've got the CSM, which is strategic. We split our upsell. So, you know, really the CSM is focused on like the strategy of the account uh, with the leaders, um, but they can go in and find any of this data, create a framework, work on it themselves. But, you know, like with anything, I think people don't just want the software these, these days, they want a partnership. Um, and that, that's definitely part of how we, how we like to work with customers, It'd be a good, good partner and help them as little or as much as they, they need or want. And you're organizationally set up to do that with that lower ratio of customer service, customer support managers to customer success managers to the actual customers that they support. Yeah, I mean, it starts with our support. So like from 7 in Europe till 7 p.m. in the East Coast, like we answer chats in 45 seconds. Uh, but that that's, that's for me, and one of the reasons I've, obsessed with these metrics and our support team 
is like most people get to like 10,000 users plus or however big they get. And then they're like, oh, let's put in a Zendesk and a ticketing system and a 24 hour SLA. And we, it's just a barrier to engaging your user. You get very little chance to actually speak to the user day to day. So when they have a question, you know, maybe there's something they don't understand or it's a, it's a way to engage them and to, to get them to use it more. So it starts with support. CS, you know, different different processes across the board, but you know, um, any opportunity we have to talk to customers, talk to people, actually teams that use the product every day is a is a huge benefit for me. It is, and that's something that your reviews show because you do have a raving reviews about your product. So thank you. I. I'd love to dive into this part of the conversation or of your approach to building the company and building the product. Talk about how do you go about building a product that is so loved by customers? <clears throat> it's another great question. So when I started the business, you know, you, you do a lot of diligence, you look around, you're learning, um, especially as coming to the end of working in a another high growth business that we sold a couple of times in 10 years. And for me, I looked at everything like the market has to be right. Timing has to be right. The product has to be great. You need to keep innovating all of those things. Like that just goes without saying um, when you build a company. But I think for me, like over time, as products and markets mature, naturally vendors start to have similar features and functionality, right? It's just inevitable. So, um, of course, you, you know, you want to do unique things. That's great. Um, and you have to. But for me, like, a way, uh, the way that you deal with customers, the way that you service customers, it's like, um, it's part of the culture. It's part of the people. It's part of the way you operate. It's part of the way you behave. So it starts with, like, what's your mission as a company? Ours is to be the best version of you. So we want to, everything we build, everything we do is to help salespeople, customer success people be better, you know, and then we think about that from like a, a cultural point of view. So what are our values? How do we behave each day with each other? Yeah. Um, and that creates a culture and, the, uh, you know, because we're living our values every day. So that, that basically that culture is what impacts our customers. That's how they feel. Um, I wrote, uh, I know talking here about a very strategy statement uh the other day and it was one of our advisors that helped me with it and it was like you know what have, what's made you successful over the last five years and what's made you you think is going to make you successful you know over the next five and at Jiminy uh it's very simple we build beautiful application uh with really great UX and UI that's simple and easy to use yeah and we uh treat every customer like they're part of the family and that they want to feel part of what we're doing. So we do think about uh, software differently, you know, and that's how we think about the customer differently, ultimately. Um, but I, I believe that can scale. You look at things like American Express, gives you a different service to other credit cards, right? You go to certain hotels, it's not that they've got a better bed, it's just they've got a better culture, better team, better service, right? So I just think in software, people don't think that's appropriate. Uh, probably stems from you know servers being in the corner of offices and being lazy and selling free five-year contracts and still but rolling out of that you know uh, older world but for me I see it as something that is unique to us and something doesn't matter how big a company is it's much more challenging to copy that because they're trying to copy a culture they're not trying to copy a service model if that makes sense it does and it's clear that from how you talk about it, that you're passionate about listening to customer, building beautiful products. And it's easy to do when you're a team of five people led by a founder who is so passionate about those things. But as the team grows, more people come, it, the organization gets bigger, it becomes harder to hear your customer because now mm -hmm. uh, there are multiple people between the developer and the customer before that it was direct communication now there is customer success and customer support and all the other organizations so how do you keep organization as a whole 
true to those values. Well, there's a, there's a more than one way to skin a cat. So as I say, so like, um, uh, there's a book called like small giants, right? You don't have to have the most amount of people and just the most amount of funding, um, to be a big and great company. So, uh, I have a kind of different philosophy again, no one's right or wrong. I feel, you know, you want to be high growth, but also look after your team and your customers and be capital efficient. I think everyone's got that model now, <laughs> but it's what's going on in the market. But, uh, so that, that it, it kind of starts from, um, a, a, a little bit of a different place, I guess, you know, when we're thinking about, um, how we, how we basically run and operate the business, you know? So what I was saying there about, um, you know, you don't have to be the biggest team. Yeah. Um, but there's probably an optimal number of people that stage appropriate, right? Depending on the size of your company, a lot of the time, look, we all make mistakes and we all do things, but you know, sometimes having too many people too quick can, can cause those issues. I think, you know, there's two things for me. You've got to hire people that are better than you at the job. So like, as we've grown, I've got great VP of product and VP of engineering. Um, so we still work really closely. We still work on the innovation. But me and James, as uh, you know, he's my technical co-founder. Like we're not the best person to run engineering and run product. We've got people who are really experienced at doing this with bigger teams before. But we are really tight. We work really closely together. Um, and you can still kind of influence um, what's right. The second part to it for me is like, doesn't matter if you're a public company on on that journey growing wherever it, whatever size you are um if you're a ceo in some way shape or form you should be spending 60 70 80 percent of your time talking to prospects and customers anyway um that's where you get the most value that's where you get your ideas from you can't just sit there and block out half day and gonna go i'm gonna be creative around the product today it doesn't work like that <laughs> you go speak to a customer you see something then you go to the gym and have a shower and you're like, ah, oh, idea, you know, because your conscious brain is like, right, it's not trying to think. So like, yeah, yeah for me, um, yeah, I think it, the one way to work around that is to hire really good people, scale at the right, um, try and scale at the right pace. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I do believe you can stay close to what the customers want and what they need. It's just, do, do you choose to invest your time there? You know, do you want to listen to customer calls? Do you want to go and meet customers? Uh, I, you know, I'm a bit different. I'm not uh, founders come in all shapes and sizes, but, you know, I have a commercial background and I learn product on the job. I love product, but I could spend 40% of my time on product, but I know it's probably not the best thing for the business, right? Um, so it's just about uh, motivation is not the right word. It's being disciplined, you know, because... You can't be motivated every single day, but you've got to be disciplined every single day. Um, just kind of the way I, I look at it. There are a lot of things on every CEO's plate and uh, meeting customers can sometimes get pushed out because of, by a bunch of more urgent matters, the, the, the ones that are burning right now. So what is your way to spend that 60% of your time with customers how do you go about it a lot of, it's a great question a lot of it is just choice you know so like if um arranging my calendar doing things you know prospects and customers meetings as well as spending time with the team one-to-ones um they're the things that take priority you know everything else um recording a podcast going to an event you know i uh very you very kindly moved this for me uh, you move the date and time why did I move it because uh, there's a cu customer call tomorrow I want to be on and uh, you know this probably it's slightly more important to me than recording a podcast on that time and day doesn't mean I won't do the podcast it's just what what order did you put it in first you know I get you and does it trickle down to your executive team that focus and that need to allocate time to talk to customers yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, someone told me a long time ago, and I, I, something I talk about with my team, like if you think of it as a pyramid where you've got operational time, tactical time, strategic time, there's this myth for people who 
haven't been C level or VPs or whatever. Oh yeah, it's a strategic role and it doesn't matter. Like being in a company with 350, 400 employees, whatever. There's only so much of your time you spend being strategic anyway. So it's the the art of it, definitely in a scaling startup, is to run up and down the ladder. You know, yeah, I can be 60% of my time operational, 20% tactical. I need to be strategic, but you you got to be running up and down the ladder. So I think you know. Um, Hopefully we create a good environment. I think, you know, a lot of my team are really close to the team and they get stuck in and I think they kind of live live the live those values in the same way. Let's talk about the origins of Jiminy and your personal mm-hmm. story. You started not from the tech side of things. Mm-hmm. So what became the trigger for you? First of all, to switch into the tech, and second, to switch from a career as a corporate leader to becoming a founder. What company I worked for previously was a company called Reward Gateway. I started there as I was 24, first salesperson running sales. We did two private equity management buyouts, grew it across three GOs, amazing experience on the board for five years. So when you do that over eight or nine years in your 20s, um and i had a great uh boss and founder called glenn elliott you know you learn so much uh so i got to the point where you know your time's up in a business and i'm obviously i had the ideas we talked about earlier i could see different challenges and stuff that i wanted to solve that i found hard in my previous job but i just had so much autonomy and so much freedom the thought the thought of even having a boss or a job like everyone has a boss right you always have investors there's always someone above you um, that doesn't go away, but um, uh, the thought of not operating like I had done and, and going into a role again and starting a new company was just in, incomprehensible. Uh, so, you know, and I'm very lucky me and James both worked at Royal Gateway. There's four or five people in the company who work there together. So when you have great people with a mix of talent where you can build something together, that's always helpful. I you think a lot of founders struggle to find a technical co-founder or they've got two founders that want to do the same role what both want to be the ceo you know so many times like startups don't fail people give up you know and it's about having the right balance and complementing complementing each other in the right way um so for me you know i was one very passionate about solving the problem but two i just uh I knew I wanted to do something else. And also at the same time, like I was a good sales leader, uh, great, I probably on a, you know, very good salesperson. Uh, but, you know, I felt like I'd done that and I didn't want to do that. Like I, I always want to push myself. So even now all the time, like, can I be a better dad? Can I be a better husband? <laughs> can I be a better founder? The team's bigger again. So just that constant, uh, need for trying to improve i think i saw a quote the other day like two things you worry about if you worry about growing and learning and you worry about like or you focus on working with great people who do those two things then everything else will kind of fall into place and you were lucky to have the group of bright people around you already so a huge opportunity to now do the second mm-hmm. thing and grow and uh, in terms of the first customers, how did you go about, okay, now we'll, we will be, build this product, but it's just us, few folks. How do we go mm-hmm. and recruit first customers for our product? Well, people might have different views on this. I probably still do it the same way, even though it was painful. So t- two things, I see it all the time when I speak to other founders or get asked for advice or, or whatever. Uh, they spend far too long building the first version because they're obsessed with it being refined. Like I called ours a beta. It was definitely an alpha. (laughs) So many things didn't work. And the other thing was I got, no one ever had it for free and they paid for it from day one. In fact, not too dissimilar to the price today. And do you know what? When people pay for it, they really care. And when you have customers that are paying you, you really care about not losing them. Um, So two things for me, like, don't over-engineer to start. Uh, I know engineers can over-engineer, so that's easier for me to say. But yeah, like just 
you're always going to it's never going to be finished it's like a piece of art you know it's never it's never complete there's always something to do to get it out the door quick and and sell it and get cuffs then you've got really engaged people that care about making it work as much as you do of course they're going to be early adopters but uh they're invested in it as much as you are so i think out of our first six or seven customers we've still got like four of them today which is unbelievable to think about the versions they've been through but um of the platform but uh yeah no it's something uh two bits of advice i give for sure when you start uh, with that alpha you are prioritizing what kind of features to build to include there and that's going to be like nine one percent of the features that you can think about and then 99 percent you will just put aside so how did you go about deciding what are the first few features that should be included in alpha so that customers will be ready to pay for it yeah i mean when i look at the tech spec now it's laughable how much we put in there and even then like what we think we would do there's stuff in there now that we're still thinking about building you know we <laughs> like six years in five years selling six years building or whatever so um it's you know there's all sorts of things in there that uh, we thought thought about doing i think you've got to think about like just the core use case what's the fundamentals that actually solves a problem so so in our case it was like right are we capturing the recording you know is it letting you do functionally do something with that recording and analyze it so you know telling you how much you talked or whatever so now we had a clear vision for what the base of the product we call it like playback today which is like where you can analyze the individual call or meeting so yeah we we just focused on that really and then you know build build around it from there you know there's we we did think about actually just going back in time now we did think about this differently artem so a lot of the time i think the what i'd call the first wave of tools from like the app exchange of salesforce right were built for the buyer so it'd be like some dashboarding tool for salesforce and like the buyer would look at it and go wow this excites me but then does anyone actually use it in the team and does it actually solve the core problem which is is the data any good from the data entry point or whatever so we actually reverse engineered it and thought i knew how important adoption was i'd seen tools working that had low adoption so for me it was like right can we get the team to love it if the team love it can we get the team to use it every single day so we actually built a rep first product that didn't have many features i mean in the early days when we were competing people used to say like oh it's a more of a rep product but that was intentional right we wanted people to really use it all the time because then if they actually used it and adopted it then we'd solve the problem for the leadership then we'd solve the problems for the exec and then over time through reporting through APIs through insights for importing other data we solved those more strategic and tactical problems so we kind of thought about it from that perspective um but yeah everyone's product's different but definitely in our space that that kind of worked for us that approach more of a bottoms up i guess approach to do but based around the user using it every day than necessarily the buyer and it should be generalizable in every mm -hmm. industry where you see that the incumbents are building products for the buyers not for the users mm -hmm. there is, should be an opportunity to build a new product for the user from the user perspective and offer it mm -hmm. bottom up so i think this is a this is a another way to think about uh, disrupting a field that you otherwise don't know how to penetrate if you just go through the standard classical ways of selling the ways that has been around in that field for a long time and speaking about the ai part of the product when did you introduce when did you decide to introduce the ai piece what was the trigger for that and what kind of ai capabilities you currently have enabled yeah so um we always knew it was going to be important because you're basically wanting to analyze the data so think of it as like if if a technical term like how are we mining all the data from um the video conference the voice call the email so like we knew about these things some of them still are not developed some of them are so when you think about com conversation intelligence like 
we started with retrospective, which is like recording. So we're analyzing after the event. We're already starting to experience and build real time. I think you'll need to do both of them really well. Um, so like transcription was the basis for all the data. So you're transcribing. Then we looked at transcribing in languages. Then you're building, um, uh, you know, algorithms and stuff to make sure we're picking up the right keywords automatically based on the conversations and everything that's going on. Um, then we started to use machine learning to do stuff like summarize the transcript because the transcript, like in the beginning, everyone was like, wow, the transcript's great. And we pick out these keywords, but then you want to see the, the right keywords. And then you want to see like customers love a summary of the transcript now so they can read a price negotiation in 90 seconds or whatever. So it keeps evolving. Um, and then we've involved stuff like sentiment analysis so we can do automated call scoring, which is almost like a way of QAing the sales call. So you narrow down where to look. So then you can sub subjectively give feedback and coach. So the two things kind of perfectly come together over time. So really it's a combination. And, you know, the, the other things that are exciting is like, um, if you think about like um, video emotion, like you're not saying anything now, but are you confused? These APIs exist out there in the market. Jiminy's not going to have to create them. But again, it's another data set. It's another data point. Um, the tonality is one. You know, I can go on and on. Uh, different things you'll be able to use um, to help understand how successful that call or meeting was and where it's going to go. What's your general view on the AI capabilities and what kind of role the AI part will play inside Jiminy products in the future? Hi, hi, I think there's still a journey to use it, use AI to like derive all the data points, right? So like when you talked about like video emotion and different things like that, like, and then analyzing expression. And so, you know, we're just still scratching the surface. Transcript can be, is really great, tells you loads about the call, but it can be binary to some extent. So then how are you looking at other data points? So I think there's still a journey to to bring other data points, but it needs to get to a point like this is a good call, this is a bad call, we're getting close to that. You, you're likely to win this deal, you're not likely to win this deal, but based on real data, I call us a super connector because we touch everything in the stack. We understand exactly what's in and outside of their CRM, and then it all becomes about pr predictability. But again, it goes back to that level of like how are we helping the sales person or the rep, how are we helping the manager, how are we helping the exec or the board? I think we'll you know, we want to be thinking about all of those things, um, you know, as a business uses this data to help make their teams better. Right. And there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of opportunities there for sure. And definitely just the beginning of the journey. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about fundraising. Mm -hmm. What's your lessons learned from that experience? And if you can contrast and compare the early stages of your fundraising with the Series A that you raised later on, how those two experiences were different? Very different. I think, uh, so first of all, I think it's really hard from pre-seed seed to A. I think it's the hardest stage. You either have got a product, barely got a product, haven't got product market fit, not got enough data, um, so actually getting someone to invest in you, you don't know. I mean, all of my contacts were in high growth private equity. So, you know, go back five, six years, if you didn't have EBITDA, they weren't really interested. So in the early stage space, I didn't actually have that many connections. Um, <clears throat> you know, I had to remortgage my house and loan money to the business and all sorts of things like that, just to get it to, to the next stage. But, um, I. I do believe in kind of bootstrapping as long as you can. Obviously, we have product costs. And then, you know, you need someone basically to believe in you. You have to push it. We took some money from a family office, which is helpful, got us to the next stage. And then we were, we were kind of quite smart. Um, once we took that money, we borrowed debt and stuff like that. So we didn't have to raise until we felt we were ready um, or we felt the data was right or we were at the right stage. But then when you get to the certain key metrics that people would say, well, that's a A round or a B round or whatever, then I think it, it, it definitely becomes 
it's never easy but like it becomes slightly easier because you've got more more behind you more substance more customers more data and i think again if you have the first institution and investor and they're supportive then they have a network and they have people so therefore you know you just get more inbound we, we were lucky as well our space is fast growing um we've got some big competitors so you know but leading up to our a round we had a lot of inbound really where it's a lot of investors coming to us you know i think what if you've got a lot of founders or aspiring founders listen to this there's lots of investors and there's not always lots of great companies to invest in so you can look at it from both perspectives if you've got if you build great company great people great culture good product you know, then, you know, there'll always be someone who will, will invest for sure. Yeah, you usually see this, if this is like the whole universe of the companies, then usually all the investors are fighting for this tiny segment of that universe. And the rest is kind of feels like there is no one, uh, there is no investment interest whatsoever. And this group feels like there is lots of investment interest, but then investors feel like, Oh, we're always competing and we always in each other's face. This dynamic is definitely something to keep in mind. In, in terms of your experience raising A round, what do you think was a good thing that you think everyone should do that way? What did you do well? And what things raising next time you would do differently? Going, going back to your other point, so to jump around, I think like if you look on LinkedIn and stuff, I, I do think it's changing slightly now. But like a lot of the time you go, oh, this person's like, you know, where they stick their company over the NASDAQ and like, oh, they're raising 20 million. They're raising 10 million. Maybe not as much now. And I think you don't see someone going, oh, we went bust today. And actually, you know what? We got turned down for a round. So for every post you see on LinkedIn that looks makes you as a founder maybe feel like, oh, it's not working for me. There's way more companies out there where it's not working or kind of not happening. But I think sometimes what, what you see on social gives you a false pretense of uh, actually the reality of of kind of, you know, basically what's what's happened. Um, for me, uh, you have to be aligned. It has to be a partnership. So the, the best way to, I think, to describe it is you're getting married to that investor. Yeah. So prepare yourself, but you know you're going to get divorced at some point. Yeah, so that is the reality of it. It's not it's not a forever thing, um, but you need to be aligned on the same things. And if you don't have that alignment, yeah. So for example, if you think you can grow a company that will be worth five hundred million and have this many employees, and you want to do it at this pace, you know, with this capital model. Um, but they invest in unicorns that are going to go public, then you've got a problem, right? <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, the biggest thing that definitely that I would give is just uh, being aligned and then you're in it together. And, you you know, even if there's different pathways that you could take, if you're aligned on what those pathways could be, um, because when you do take institutional money, there is an end point. You know, private equity works in five-year cycles. Different investment funds have different returns. So, You've got to be aligned on on what that is, what the growth rate is going to be, you know, and you need you need to find good people who have found a friendly and are going to be have empathy for how hard it is, you know, what the, the what you've got to go through and, you know, make sure that they're supportive as well. That last point about empathy is important and quite r- rare to come by. It's it's really hard to really understand the, what it takes to be a founder of a company from the sidelines mm-hmm. or even from within the company if you're not a founder. So that appreciation is definitely a very valuable quality of any investor one can get. Okay, for our last question, let's talk about the long-term goals for the company. What's your vision for the future? Of Jiminy? I like to look at it from a couple of different ways. So, just all about Jiminy reaching its potential. Like, when you look at where we are in kind of pricing, like upper middle, the reason I, we stay around there is I think like every customer facing team should be able to afford this software. 
you know, and it should be something that every every business has. How do we get to hundreds of thousands of customers um, so we can help people more and more? You know, that that is the goal, right? Is to to live that that mission um, along the way. H- how do we get there? Um, for me, there's kind of two sides to it. I've talked a lot about we're only just scratching the surface. There's way more data to derive from the co- conversations and meetings that are happening. And then how practically do you use this data to help drive the business forward? Um, and then for me, there's very interesting stuff around uh, what we've done. We've done a lot of is like almost like a self-driving car for the CRM. You know, that that database is always going to exist, whether it's Salesforce, HubSpot, Pipedrive, you know, whatever CRM anyone uses is like we're already we automatically put the summary into the CRM. We automatically log a task, create a contact. You know, um, when you do this real time, you think about things like chat GPT and then, OK, well, this competitor is mentioned on the transcript in real time. How can you then um, give you some insight and battle card in real time on this competitor? You know, then put that information straight into the CRM saying this competitor was involved. You know, it just it should should automate. So for me, it's really exciting. I think even on the core products and the core core platform, there's so much uh, to go, not just in terms of technology, but how business practic- practically use it. Um, and then I think like the next wave of SaaS is like, we have all these great applications that can do great things, but they it often doesn't happen quickly because you're relying on the human to do it. So like when, when the guys <laughs> come to me about building stuff, I'm like, oh, does it A, you have to do anything there yet? And then if they say yes, I say, we're not building it. Because they like, they, you know, it's not that I don't like I've had I've run sales teams for years. I just know that if you're asking a sales rep to go manually do something again, inevitably it's likely to not happen 50 percent of the time. So how do we keep taking stuff off their plate, whether it's stopping them taking notes, doing different things is all just part of the, the journey, really. Keep taking stuff off their plates until uh, they can focus fully only on the things they do best is to talk to customers. Mm got you yeah but i would say um it doesn't matter how much of that you do like what you know takes ten thousand hours to master something six years even now after i've been working for 20 years next year you know b2b sales for nearly like 15 of that i learn stuff every day you know in terms of like how we move the process forward of our team i think it's that thing around having a mindset like if people aren't growing and they aren't learning and developing, that's when they start to worry about other things. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, as long as, as long as you're growing and you're working with great people, then those other things don't, don't seem to bother you as much because you are, you need to expand and keep learning. I think is, is the key thing for me. And you have this huge benefit of being able to learn new things and improve Jiminy using your own company as an example, as a uh, perfect customer for it, because you leverage Jiminy quite a bit, I understand, within your go-to-market. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all, all the time. Like, uh, where was I on the train yesterday? You know, and just being able to, like, listen to a conversation that someone shared with me in Slack, you know, and, like, leave a comment or a you know, suggestion there. That's a really simple use case. But yeah, I think uh, it's, I think we're very lucky as well because the space we're in and we grow, like people call it dog food in your own product. I think if you, if you're selling something, you know, complex to like data scientists and you've got a sales team, that's a hard thing to get them to really engage with it, use it, believe in it, be passionate about it. We're very lucky that, I know it sounds insane, but for our first four years, we didn't even have a QA. Like, it's just, it's almost like unbelievable. Uh, we've got a whole team of QAs now, automated frameworks, all of that stuff. But, you know, in the beginning, we're just using it so much and in it all the time that, you know, we didn't need to and we bootstrap things. So, you know, it's kind of lucky. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge benefit. Okay, where can listeners learn more about uh, Jiminy? How can they follow you on social media? And if you're hiring, where they can learn about the positions? Yeah. We have careers on the website, but if you go, it's Jiminy, J-I-M-I-N-N-Y, so Jiminy.com, um, and you can chat to any of the team through there. We have like a chat. If someone wants to reach out to me personally, 
um, they can just put my email in on LinkedIn. I'm a Tom Lavery seven on Twitter. Pretty good at getting back to people. So if anyone wants any help, I'm especially people who are uh, maybe going through what I've been through in the last sort of five or six years going to business. I'm always happy to have a conversation and help anyone for sure. Sounds good. We'll add those uh, links to the show notes. Tom, thanks a lot for joining me today. Thanks, Artem. Pleasure.